Welcome to the online classroom for the module FIN 3701, um, Financial Management. Uh, we are currently uh, going through um, the first assignment. That's what we're going to be looking at in this class uh, as we look at the third level financial management module for this UNISA uh, course, right? So um, the assignment that we're going to be looking at uh, for semester two, assignment one, consists of three questions. It consists of three questions. And the questions are mainly covering um, capital budgeting, cash flows, and capital budgeting techniques. Uh, we're given three questions. The first question is a 10 mark question covering uh, capital budgeting cash flows and capital budgeting techniques. So I'm going to take you through this question. And then the second question is a 20 mark question uh, covering, I think this, this is covered in study unit two or three, uh, whereby we look at how to adjust for risk, risk adjusted measures uh, when it comes to capital budgeting. And then the last cash flow uh, has to do with calculating the cost of capital, uh, the cost of debt financing, uh, the cost of uh, equity finance, um, and so forth. So what I'm going to do in this class, I'm just going to be going through this assignment and I'll be doing the calculations, just offering guidance to you explaining um, how everything goes and what it's all about. And I hope by the end of the class, you will have learned a lot to help you. So uh, like I was saying, question number one covers uh, items from lesson one and lesson two. Question number two covers items from lesson three. And question number four covers items from lesson four and lesson five, if you're checking your study guide. Right, so we can get started with the first question. So uh, the first question says, uh, we have a company uh, which is a large manufacturer of air aircraft components and it has a capital budget of 2 million. The company has 2 million to, to spend and they are looking at possibly replacing one of their existing machines with a more sophisticated model. So the chief financial officer already did these calculations for you, already determined the initial investment for you. Remember, you have to be able to determine the initial investment. Uh, the CFO also determined the terminal cash flow for you, but you as a student also have to be able to determine the terminal cash flow. So the initial investment was calculated to be 1,666,000. And the terminal cash flow was calculated to be 254,000. We are told that the machine has a useful life of five years, right? It's got five years remaining. Uh, so remember in the online classes, right? Uh, that I, I gave you access to before, if you're enrolled, we, we talked about how to determine the initial investment in the first learning unit and also how to determine the terminal cash flow. But fortunately for this question, these were given to you, so you don't have to worry about them. So what we were then what what we were then given, we were then given uh, the expected cash inflows um, from the proposed machine. So if we get the new machine, these are the cash flows that we are going to expect, whereas the current cash flow is currently giving us these. Uh, Sorry, the current machine is currently giving us these cash flows, right? So it makes sense, right? Remember, with the with the replacement, uh, with the replacement capital budgeting project, you you will usually have a current machine and a new machine, and then you want to try to determine what extra benefits you're getting from the proposed machine. What is the incremental benefit from the new machine? Remember. The other type of uh, capital budgeting um, uh, project is when you try to do an expansion. With an expansion, you don't have to worry about current and proposed. You just worry about the proposed, right? So make sure you understand the distinction between a replacement and an expansion. Replacement 
you need to compare current minus proposed and get the difference between the two for expected cash inflows. Whereas with an expansion, you're just concerned with the cash flows for the proposed machine. We're also given our work and our tax rate. So the first question says, calculate the incremental cash flows relating to the replacement decision. So if our mach machine uh, is currently giving us cash flows. We expect it to give us cash flows of 895 in the next year, whereas the proposed machine is going to give us 986. It means that the actual benefit we are going to get uh, as a result of the new machine is actually 986 minus 895. So the new machine is actually going to add 91,000 to our cash flows. This is what we call the incremental cash flow. So we can do that for each of the future years, uh, subtract each of those uh, cash flows from the proposed machine minus the current machine. And then these are the incremental cash flows we get, right? So that's the answer to the first part. So I know some students, and then of course, the, the, the initial investment was already given. And then the terminal cash flow is 254. So we know that in the final year, we will add 254,195 when we are calculating NPV. Now, a lot of students were asking, what about the tax rate? What do we do with the tax rate? We have a 29% here. What about the 29% tax rate? Now, with regards to this 29% tax rate, this tax rate has no effect on our cash flows. This tax rate has no effect on our cash flows because these are already cash inflows. The tax rate has already been, uh, been accounted for. Remember, when we're calculating cash inflows, operating cash inflows, we, we take our, our sales or our revenue, we subtract our variable costs, right? We get our gross profit, then we subtract our fixed costs, right? Remember, we subtract our fixed costs, sorry. And then um, we subtract depreciation. Sometimes depreciation is included in the fixed costs or the, or the operating expenses, right? And then once we subtract all our operating expenses, we're left with our EBIT, which is our operating profit, then we remove tax, then we get no part, then we add, we add depreciation, and then we get the operating cash flow. Sorry, the pen here. Yeah? yeah. So this was done for you already. All of this has been done for you. You are already here. So there's no need for you to then apply tax again. So don't worry about this tax rate. It's already been accounted for. You've already been given this answer for the proposed machine for each of the expected five years, and also this answer for the current machine for each of the expected five years. So if you subtract those two, uh, that will give you the, the incremental cash flows for each year. So you subtract each of those values, and you don't have to, to worry about anything else. And then you can also just state what your initial investment is and also what your terminal cash flow is. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question asks us to calculate uh, the net present value and the internal rate of return. You are asked to calculate the net present value and the internal rate of return for this particular project. So in this case, um, you need to use your financial calculator, whereby you enter each of your cash flows uh, into your financial calculator, then you can calculate your net present value and your internal rate of return. And it's important to note that in year five, you add your final operating cash inflow plus the terminal value to give you the total year five cash flow. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put up a, an HP financial calculator to show you how to do that calculation. I hope you can see the calculator there. So the first thing with this calculator, we have to create and to check if it's on one PYR. As we can see, our calculator is on 12 PYR. So we have a problem there. So what we can do to fix this, you can press one 
redshift button, then PMT PYR. Yeah. So you press one redshift button, then PMT PYR, and then our calculator is now on one PYR. And then after that, we can enter in each of our cash flows. The first one uh, is one million. Uh, 666,000, that's the cash flow at time zero. Uh, the cash flow at time one is 91,000. Then you press CF. So you keep pressing CF. The second incremental cash flow was 105. You press CF. The third was 167. You press CF. The fourth was 181. You press CF. Uh, the fifth was 195. You press CF. And then um, our interest rate, uh, we were told to use an interest rate of 15%, 15%, 15% um, interest, right? Uh, and then we can then calculate our NPV. Sorry, I hope you can all see the calculator there. Uh, yeah, we can then calculate our NPV by saying, uh, shift NPV. So we get minus 199. Uh, sorry, did we get that right? Let me just read you that calculation. Uh, let me stop share. Not sure. I'm seeing multiple windows here. I might have to start the calculation again. Uh, let me just clear my calculator and I'll start that calculation again. We said uh, 166. One, two, three, uh, plus minus, and we press CF, 91, CF, 105, CF, 167, CF, 181, uh, sorry, don't know. Sorry about that, I have to, 166, CF, 91, CF, 105, CF, 167, CF, 181, CF, and then uh, 195, 195, I think that's where I made the mistake plus the terminal value. So that's 449, I think that's where my mistake was. 449, one, two, three, CF, yeah. And then 15 is our discount rate, red shift button, then you come to NP, there we go. 107.0949.58, so that, uh, that is our answer, okay? So that's what we were supposed to do there. So uh, I hope you, you all see that and you follow it, right? So what we can even do after this, we can even then get our, our IRR. To get your IRR, you just press the red shift button. After entering in all your cash flows like I did, you press the red shift button, then you press uh, this button, CST, underneath it says interest, IRR, the interest rate, the, the internal rate of return. Then we get minus 12.39, okay? So uh, that's how we were supposed to, to do that calculation. I'm just trying to make sure that uh, you're familiar with your calculator. Right, and then after that, we are asked, based on the NPV and IRR calculated above, uh, would you advise Cofold Limited to invest their funds in replacement? Provide a reason for your answer. Obviously, as we can see that the net present value is negative, and also our IRR is less than the cost of capital, which is the work. Uh, we should not invest in this project. So Cofold Limited should not invest their funds in the replacement as the NPV is negative and the IRR is less than the WAC. Okay, so that was question number one. Key things to remember here as we move on to question number two. Firstly, for replacement decisions, you always have to look at the cash flows the current uh, machine or current project is giving you and the new project or new machine. Then you need to subtract those to get your incremental cash flows. 
Lesson number two, if these are already cash inflows, tax has been uh, taken into account. There's no reason to, to account for tax again. Uh, lesson number three, uh, make sure you're fine with the two capital budgeting techniques using your financial calculator. Yeah. So, and also remember, we add the 254, 254,000, the terminal cash flow. Uh, to the final year uh, incremental uh, operating cash flow. So that's important. Next, we move on to this 20 mark question, uh, which involves uh, risk refinements in capital budgeting. I think it's learning unit three in your study guide uh, in the module. So suppose Haga PLC has two alternative uses for a warehouse. Uh, the company can store toxic waste containers, right? or electronic equipment. And then we're given the, the, the cash flows and risk associated with the two independent investments are given below. So we're given this information. So these are independent projects. Um, yeah. And then we're told uh, toxic waste containers is expected to give us the following cash inflows. Um, yeah, 40, 20, 16, 12. Uh, and 10, 10, then we're given certainty equivalence and we're given the risk-free rate of interest. Electronic equipment, we're also given the years and the cash inflows. We're given the risk-free rate as well as uh, the risk premium. So I just want to explain some important things here. Uh, first of all, uh, please note that I noticed in a previous semester's assignment, you'll notice that your cash flows at time zero are given as positives here, right? for both questions. I believe that's actually a misprint. In the previous semester's assignment, those initial cash flows were also given as positives in the question, but in the assignment solutions memo, uh, it was actually supposed to be negative. So we're going to take this 40,000 as a negative with the cash outflow, and this 56,000 as a negative as well, it's a cash outflow, right? And then uh, this certainty equivalence, these uh, factors, the way these factors work, they are used to change risky cash flows. They are used to change risky uh, cash flows into riskless, into riskless cash flows. In other words, this certainty equivalence can be used to remove the riskiness from these cash flows. You know, these cash flows are uncertain, right? They are uncertain. So if we multiply these cash flows with their certainty equivalent, we can get a certain answer. And that answer that we get is the equivalent of these risky cash flows as riskless cash flows. In other words, we are removing the riskiness associated with these cash flows and getting the cash flow we think we will receive for certain, right? So uh, I'll just show you this. Um, I'll show you this here. So what we're saying here, right? We are saying that, uh, of course, the initial investment is always known because we spend that today. But this 20,000 that's being received at the end of the first year, this 20,000, right? We don't know what it's going to be. It could be higher than that. It could be lower than that. But if we're told that the certainty equivalent is 0 0.9, it means that um, even though at the end of the first year, we expect to get 20,000, we are saying that the value we are certainly going to get is 18,000. So this 18,000 has risk removed away from it. And it's a cash flow we are saying we are certain to get. It's got no risk associated with it. This 16,000 is what we expect to get at the end of the second year, but there's uncertainty around this. So we can multiply this by its certainty equivalent to get 12,800. And then what we're saying, we're saying that at the end of the second year, we are saying that we are definitely going to get 12.8. Like this is the risk-free cash flow. Once we remove uncertainty and everything else, we are saying that we are certain to get at least 12.8, even though we expect 16 we are certain to get 12.8. So that's where the certainty equivalent is coming into play. So once we've removed the risk from these cash flows by multiplying by the certainty equivalent coefficient to get the riskless cash flows, 
we can then discount these riskless cash flows, these cash flows without risk, these risk-free cash flows. We can then discount them uh, using the risk-free rate. So that's important. The idea behind multiplying these cash flows with the certainty equivalent is to remove the risk associated with the cash flows. And once we've converted these cash flows into risk-free cash flows, we can then discount them using our risk-free rate. So that's an important lesson. Risk-free cash flows, risk-free cash flows are discounted using the risk-free rate. And then risky cash flows, cash flows with the risk associated are discounted using uh, the, the cost of capital or the risk adjusted discount rate. Cost of capital or the, the risk adjusted discount rate. Risk adjusted discount rate, which we are going to deal with in the, the next NP calculation. So in this case, we then discount. So I've shown you on the financial calculator, right? You just have to clear your calculator, make sure it's on one PYR, enter in each of your cash flows, rate shift in PV after your interest, and then you can also calculate your internal rate of return. So clearly we can see with this project it's got a negative NPV and its internal rate of return is also less than the cost of capital. So this so far, it's not a good project to invest in. We shouldn't invest in that first project. Then lastly, electronic equipment. Electronic equipment is a bit straightforward. We've just been given the risky cash flows. We don't have to, we haven't been given the certainty equivalents here. Right, we haven't been given the certainty equivalence, but again, we take the fifty-six thousand as a negative, and then we calculate our our risk adjusted discount rate by taking the risk-free rate plus uh, the risk premium. Right, so we take the risk-free rate which is 8% plus the risk premium, which is 2%. So our risk adjusted discount rate is 10%. So given the uncertainty associated with these future cash flows, we are saying the appropriate discount rate to discount these cash flows with this 10%. So we can then go to our financial calculator like I showed you earlier, and you can calculate your NPV and your IRR. So electronic equipment is a good project. Uh, as we can see, the NPV is positive and also the internal rate of return is greater than the discount rate. So you can practice this uh, if you have an HP calculator using that approach that I showed you with the first question we did for question one. And then obviously based on the NPV and IRR, we would rather select electronic equipment investment. Firstly, because it's got a positive NPV and its IRR is greater than the cost of capital. The last question we have here uh, is based on learning unit four from our study guide. It's where we have to calculate the cost of capital. We have to calculate the cost of capital. Remember the cost of equity, the cost of debt, uh, the cost of preference shares, you need to be familiar with all of that. Also factoring in net proceeds and all of those other uh, important factors. So let's read the question, then we'll give it a try as we finish off this assignment. So we're told when data uh, resources seeks to invest 10 million uh, in a new mining project in order to expand its gold production capacity. The management of the company prefers to maintain the present 35% debt, 55% equity, and 10% preference share capital structure. Debt financing can be obtained by issuing a five year 1000 Rand bond. The current price of the bond is 1123 and it pays 10% coupons. Then data results as a bit of 1.3. The expected return on the market portfolio is 16% and the current risk free rate is 8%. The company is contemplating issuing 10% preference shares that are expected to sell for a par value of 60 rand per share. The cost of issuing and selling the shares is expected to be 5%. The tax rate is 29%. Calculate when data resources, component costs, and then calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So we'll start with the cost of debt. 
So with the cost of debt, uh, we can use our financial calculator. And it's important, so there are important things to note here when you're using your financial calculator. I am going to go to the financial calculator to show you how to do this one. But just in some important things to note, remember the cost of debt, right, that we are concerned with is the after-tax cost of debt. And then what we calculate with our financial calculator, the yield to maturity, that's actually uh, the cost of debt before tax. That's actually the cost of debt. It's actually the cost of debt before tax. So the answer you get is your yield to maturity um, when you use your financial calculator is actually the cost of debt before tax. And then you have to take that answer, multiply it by one minus the tax rate. And then the answer you get afterwards is the after tax cost of debt, right? So that's the first and important uh, thing you need to note. And then the second thing you need to note is that um, you get your coupon rate, your N, your future value. Be careful with your coupon rate and your N, whether you have semi-annual or quarterly compounding, uh, quarterly coupon payments, semi-annual coupon payments, because that would mean, for example, if you have quarterly coupon payments, you would have to divide by four year, and you would have to multiply by four year if it was quarterly coupon payments. And then the answer you get here, you would have to multiply by four, right? To, to change it into the annual. But in this case, even if it was semi-annual, you need to look out for that in the exam. If it was semi-annual, uh, you would multiply this by two, divide this by two, and then the answer you get here, you would have to multiply by two. So that's something else to look out for. The last thing to look out for is your PV. So PV is usually our price, the price of the bond, right? The price the bonds are issued at. But sometimes that price, you need to subtract expenses like flotation costs uh, and marketing expenses to reduce the, the PV to get your net proceeds. So always be careful to check to see if you've been given any net proceeds because you might have to, to factor those in uh, and reduce them, right? So in this case, we haven't been given those. We can just proceed and enter in uh, our values. So we can go, to, and then remember, when you enter in your PV, you also always enter it as a negative, right? So we can, we can go to our financial calculator. Uh, then as usual, we can clear the calculator, red shift button clear, red shift clear. Then we can enter in um, the values that we need to enter in. One, one, two, three, negative uh, PV, 1000 FV, uh, 5N, 10% uh, uh, times 1000 uh, is equals to this. This is our PMT, press equal to then PMT. Uh, did I get that calculation correct? Okay, let me just start that again. We said 1123 negative PV, uh, 1000 FV, 5N. 10% uh, of 1,000, uh, that's our PMT, and then the interest. Okay, I need to, to do this one again. Okay, let's try that again. I'm not sure if I press something wrong there. Let me just clear my calculator. One, one, two, three, negative PV. Uh, 1,000 is my future value. Five is my N, uh, ten percent of one thousand as my PMT, and then my interest is seven percent. So we got it there. And then once we get our interest, we can then take our interest, multiply it by one minus the tax, and then that gives us the after-tax cost of debt. Okay. 
Next is the cost of equity. Remember, we're asked to calculate the cost of debt, equity, and preferences. So remember, with the cost of equity, there are two approaches, right? We can use the Gordon growth model. The Gordon growth model says we take the current dividend uh, multiplied by one plus our growth rate divided by our, uh, is that it? Yeah, divided by our price plus growth. This is one approach to calculating the cost of existing equity existing equity. The other approach to calculating uh, the cost of existing equity is using the capital asset pricing model, which says the cost of equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by the return on the market minus the risk-free rate, where this is the market risk premium. So you have to look at the information given to decide which one to use. So this is actually the cost of existing equity. And then remember the cost of new equity would be D0 multiplied by one plus G over net proceeds. Again, you would have to check for flotation costs uh, and issuing costs. And then once you divide those two, you then add the growth rate as well. This would be the cost of new equity. Uh, and then also remember that D01 plus G is just equal to D1. So you need to check if you've been given the current dividend or the expected dividend. Are you given the current dividend or expected dividend? If you're given the expected dividend, it's just D1 over NP plus G for the cost of new equity and D1 over P plus G for the cost of existing equity. So in this case, we need to use the capital asset pricing model because we've been given beta, the risk-free rate, and the return on the market portfolio. So we can easily uh, substitute that into our formula. And then remember, bot mass, uh, it's 8.3 plus 1.3, uh, 16 minus 8. So it's, it's better to just, to just use your, your calculator uh, to do all of this. Let's, let's put the calculator here. Be careful of bond mass. Just enter everything in at once. Just enter everything in at once. Don't do things bit by bit. Okay. So eight one point three sixteen eight. So you would say eight plus one point three times open bracket sixteen. You see, I'm doing it all at once, and then I get my answer, which is eighteen point four. Some students will make this mistake. Some students will say eight. Some students will say eight plus 1.3. They'll get the answer. Then they'll say times uh, 16 minus eight, which is wrong. It's a common mistake. 16 minus eight. It's a common, common mistake that you need to be, to be careful of. Don't make this mistake, please. So just enter everything into your calculator and then your calculator will get you the answer. So that's the cost of equity. And then finally, the cost of preference shares. With the cost of preference shares, again, um, it's similar to uh, that formula we use for the long growth model. You simply take your dividend divided by the price for current uh, preference shares. And then for new preference shares, you take your fixed dividend. Remember, preference shares are the fixed dividend divided by the net proceeds. So in this case, we're dealing with net proceeds because we've been given um, flotation costs of 5%, right? So our net proceeds are going to be the, the par value issue price minus uh, 5% uh, times 60, right? So, so that's really, really important. Right, so we, we then get our net proceeds there. So our net proceeds would be 60 minus 5% times 60, giving us 57. Those are the net proceeds. And then our dividend, obviously our dividend is just going to be the, the dividend percentage on the preference share, which is 10%, 10% multiplied by uh, our par value, 10% multiplied by our par value of 60, 
60 times 10 percent giving us six right so give six over 57 so the preference here dividend here would be six six divided by 57 giving us 0 0.1052 which is 10.52 percent okay or 10.53 if we round off correctly so those are the costs. Practice on this cost for existing and new, right? And then finally, we can calculate our weighted average cost of capital. The WAC simply says the weight in debt minus the after-tax cost of debt plus the weight in equity times the cost of equity plus the weight in preference shares times the cost of preference shares. So these ways, 35%, 55%, and 10%, we've already been given these, right? We were told these costs right here, 35%, 55%, and 10%. We were told those costs, uh, and we've calculated all of these costs. Remember, here we use the after-tax cost of debt. Some, some students prefer to use the tabular format here for their work. It's still fine where they say uh, source of capital, right? Then they have debt, uh, uh, ordinary shares, which is our equity, and then they have uh, preference here. Some students prefer to use this approach. Then they have weights, right? Let's just scroll down. They have weights, okay? And then for their weights, here we have 0 0.35, 0 0.5. You can also use this approach, uh, 0 0.10. Then we have cost, after tax cost especially since we have debt. Remember, we don't have to adjust for tax for equity and preference shares. Uh, 4.97%, 18.4%, and 10.53%. Uh, and then we say weighted cost. This will still get you the answer. So with the weighted cost, you say 0 0.35 times 4.97, giving us one, 0.7395. Then you say 0 0.55 times 18.4, giving us 10.12. And then 0 0.10 times 10.53, giving us 1.053. And then we can add 1.053 plus 10.12 plus 1.7. 395 and we get 12.91. So that would be right here, 12.91. So you would have another row here where you write total, where you write work to show what your work is. So that, that's the other approach. Both approaches would still give you the same answer. So it's up to you to decide the, the approach that, that works for you. Okay. Okay, so that brings us to an end of the class. Uh, I hope the, the class has been helpful uh, and you learned a lot. As usual, any questions or queries with regards to anything covered in this class, please feel free to let me know. Um, I won't always be able to get back to you promptly, but I'll try to do so as soon as I can. Thank you very much and all the best with your studies.